Welcome, everybody, and thank you for taking time out of your morning and lunchtime to join us today for a pretty amazing and I'll say important conference put on by No Diabetes by Heart, which is a joint initiative by the American Heart Association and the American Diabetes Association. I'm Dr. Neil Skolnick, Professor of Family and Community Medicine at the Sidney Kimmel Medical College of Thomas Jefferson University and Associate Director of the Family Medicine Residency Program at Abington Jefferson Health. I will be moderating today's session and we have an incredible academic faculty from a broad array of backgrounds. I'll ask each one of us to introduce ourselves in turn, starting with Dr. Munchie. Hello. Uh, well, greetings. Uh, and uh, thank you for, thank you for uh, inviting me to the American Diabetes Association. I'm Meida Munshi. I'm uh, I'm Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. I direct the Jocelyn Geriatric Diabetes Program, and uh, I am a geriatrician at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. Darren? Thanks, Neil. Welcome. Um, I am the uh, representative cardiologist. I'm a professor of medicine at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. I'm a clinical trialist, and I've worked in the diabetes and cardiovascular space for about 25 years now, and it's a pleasure to come together with the American Diabetes Association, and part of my role here is I'm the incoming chair of the American Heart Association uh, Committee on Diabetes. Thanks so much. Tracy? Good day. Um, I'm Tracy Tavera. I'm a professor of pharmacy at the University of Rhode Island College of Pharmacy and an adjunct professor of medicine at Brown University, and I have a clinical and research appointment with the Department of Veteran Affairs Medical Center. Thanks so much, Tracy. And so as everyone can see, we have a broad array of backgrounds. Here on uh, the slides, we can see people's disclosures. Um, we'll give you a moment to look at that. And uh, before we begin, We'd like to recognize that No Diabetes by Heart is here because of our founding sponsors, Borenheimer Ingelheim, Lilly, Novo Nordisk, along with national sponsors, Sanofi, AstraZeneca, and Bayer. And we really want to appreciate and recognize them for the support they give in order for us to put together quality programs like this. And and that's and the reason why I say quality programs like this is this is just one of many programs. So Feel free, not feel free. We encourage you to visit the redesigned No Diabetes by Heart website, which, believe it or not, you can find by going to nodiabetesbyheart.org. And in that website, there's downloadable content for patients, there's guideline-based information, there's case studies, and a whole library of webinars and podcasts that are going to be constantly updated with lectures like this. Um, stay tuned. You're, you're registered now for this. You'll also get additional emails, but we promise not too many emails for um, new things that come out related to diabetes, cardiovascular and renal research that is going to be presented soon in the ADA scientific sessions. There'll be discussions on health equity, health disparities, as well as an overview of wearable devices. So there's going to be some great information coming out in the scientific sessions. And we'll do our best to get some of that information uh, back out to you. Now, programs like this come alive partly because of the preparation of the speakers. But I'll tell you the other reason that they come alive, and, and it's the people listening. And there's over 300 people that are watching this webinar today. And we really want to encourage you to, to submit your questions in the chat box, because in order for us to do our best job, and the reason we don't have just you know one person talking or from one specialty is we really wanna have a range of opinions and those opinions best meet your needs if you submit questions. So during the talk, and we'll have a number of breaks during the talk, during the talk, please submit your questions and we'll try to address as many as possible because that's what really makes programs like this come alive. And now turn over the floor, Midha, to you uh, to talk about your section. Hey. Thank you, thank you, uh, Neil. And um, I'm just trying to get the screen. Okay. 
Um, so uh, my, my topic for discussion today is uh, older adults, uh, uh, heterogeneous population. And as you know, no talk on older adults uh, starts without discussing who is older adults. And, and most of the time we think about age in number as something that we go along uh, for defining an older adults. However, uh, you know, and now, now that uh, we are, you know, with the society aging, we are all seeing more and more older patients in our practices. We know that there is something more than just age uh, that, that really defines the older adults. So let's talk about who is an older adult. And if I ask you to think about an 85 year old patient with diabetes in your practice, some of you might be thinking about a person that looks like this. And some of us might be thinking about a person that looks like that. And, and you can imagine that uh, not only the goals of diabetes care, but also the strategy we will use to manage these two older patients of the same age differently. However, one of the things as a geriatrician I want to uh, sort of push uh, uh, across is that even the individual who looks very healthy and highly functional at the age of 85, needs to have certain consideration that we would, uh, we would uh, think of in older patient. And, and this is about the homeostenosis. Homeostenosis is a progressive constriction of the homeostatic reserve. And what I mean by that is that with increasing age, there is a decline in physiological reserve. And physiological reserve is, is what allows us to maintain uh, homeostasis in the presence of various, uh, uh, you know, uh, various things such as uh, clinical or physiological or, or even uh, psychological uh, st uh, stresses. And this homeostasis, a, a sort of a line beyond which a homeostasis cannot be achieved narrows with the age. And so what happens is that if you have a stressor of a certain magnitude, and it could be a, a, a pneumonia or, or a trauma or even a hypoglycemia, if that occurs at younger age, that may fall into the into a, a reserve line where the person can achieve the baseline status. The same stimul, same amount of stressor, if it happens at an older age, that may go beyond patient's capacity to come back to their baseline. And we see that all the time when people are, are admitted to the hospital with various infection, younger people do uh, recover quickly and go out and older people many a times uh, go from one problem to different, uh, you know, renal failure, falls, pressure ulcers, and achieve poor outcome. So, uh, so the message is to respect the age, even though people do look different and do need to be treated differently at different age. The other uh, issue about older adults is where they live. And, and the Living status presents the uh, management challenges. When you think about a patient who is living independently, uh, we know that complex uh, uh, treatment regimens can be uh, quite challenging for them. And, and we do that, we, we educate them, we re-educate them, and we uh, try to uh, get them to manage their diabetes better. However, if they are living without any uh, support system, then especially after acute illnesses, this population is likely to get into trouble. And we have to be aware of that fact, especially if they are on a complex regimen. If they are in an assisted living facility, and most of them actually provide support for for diet or for, for providing medications, but assisted care facilities in most of the states do not provide support for monitoring, glucose monitoring and insulin injections. And again, those are the times when people who are residing in these facilities can get into trouble. And a lot of them also don't have a whole lot of control over the timing or the, or the uh, type of food that they, they get. And we have to consider that when we develop the uh, treatment strategy. Nursing home, the people who live in nursing home, that's actually a, 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 
different uh, type of population, we know that they are sicker, they have more comorbidities, they have higher risk of side effects from the different medications. However, majority of these patients uh, do, do not do their own self-care. So uh, what they are supposed to eat and when they should have finger stick monitoring and when they are supposed to get their insulin injection is done by nursing home staff. So if the staff is appropriately educated, then you can imagine that this population can be treated in much more complex, with a complex regimen uh, than, than, than what you can do in an independent living uh, facilities. And then lastly, the comorbidities, the, the, the difference between the younger and older age group that both aging as well as diabetes increases the risk of various conditions. Macro and microvascular diseases are the, are the group of conditions that we know well. We know why we should be looking for that and how to manage that. But there is a group of conditions, so-called geriatric syndrome, like cognitive dysfunction, depression, physical disability, polypharmacy. These conditions do occur at higher frequency in older adults with diabetes. And the reason to know that and understand that is because they they are quite subtle. Majority of the time, uh, patients as well as clinicians may miss that, and they do impact patients' ability to care for their diabetes. And so when we thought about the uh, the goals of care for older adults, you know, it is not, and this is the framework for the American Diabetes Association. Now we have several other organizations that have similar structures, but the idea behind that is very similar, that when you think about, say, uh, goals, you put your patient in one of the three groups. It could be healthy, intermediate, or complex. And the way your patient falls into one of the group is by three variables. What else is going on? What other comorbidities they have? And we are not talking about high blood pressure and cholesterol, the comorbidities that in, impact their ability to care for themselves. If they have no comorbidities, their cognitive function is intact and their functional status is intact, then they fall into the healthy category. If they have <clears throat> multiple end-stage diseases, if they have a moderate to severe cognitive dysfunction or uh, more than two in, uh, activities of daily living dependency, then they fall into very complex group and then rest of them are in the middle. And based on where they are, you do decide on their goals, not only the diabetes related goals, but probably also the blood pressure and lipid related goals. And we'll see what Dr. McGuire says about that. Uh, and then on the third, uh, you know, sort of a, a group, you can divide them up into the three more groups, a little more defined where if they are in the rehab or, you know, when they are supposed to go back home after getting better, then you do want them uh, to have a little tighter control. Uh, but then if they are in the nursing home or they are at the end of the life care, then we again needs to uh, consider how the goal should be. I want to point out that especially in this group of patients, we are used to thinking about goals in the terms of hemoglobin A1c, but the hemoglobin A1c is a glycation of RBC molecule that we uh, predict or, or we think of that as a, uh, living for three months, and that may not be true because of anemia, because of acute infections, because of renal dysfunction. And so many a times it's more prudent to think about uh, finger stick glucose goals uh, for that population rather than thinking about A1C. And with that, I would hand over to Dr. McGuire and, uh, uh, for the next session. So, Thank you, Maida. See if I can get control of the slides. Darren, oh, there you go. Great. There we go. Okay, so um, I'm going to pivot just a bit. Um, we have nice bookend uh, sessions uh, during this uh, symposium, uh, very practical clinical considerations. And I'm gonna dive in here in the middle and just, uh, just do a 30,000 foot overview of the totality of the cardiovascular safety data that we have with the newer classes of medications that have been developed 
for type 2 diabetes. As you know, since 2008, we've been doing large-scale randomized cardiovascular safety trials of all of the new agents. And importantly, a few of the agents not only have demonstrated safety, but incremental efficacy. But I think these two concepts are very important uh, to consider in, in parallel for the advanced age patient population. We have to focus on safety at least as much as we're focusing on efficacy for these medications. So we've done a good job of mitigating cardiovascular risk in type 2 diabetes, but we haven't completely eroded the incremental risk that is associated with type 2 diabetes for a number of cardiovascular complications. So these are data I had the privilege of collaborating with uh, Gothenburg Sweden investigators and analyzed the data set of the Swedish National Diabetes Registry. These data represent uh, 500,000 patients with type 2 diabetes represented in the blue lines and each one matched with five uh, controls without diabetes matched on age and sex and county of residence. And so these data represent about 3 million patients over about a 15 year period of time. And what you can see on the left was about a twofold incremental risk for myocardial infarction associated with type 2 diabetes when the study began in 1998. And a rapid uh, reduction in that risk over time, um, more uh, a larger drop in the patients with diabetes than those without diabetes. And so we have narrowed the gap uh, with the myocardial infarction risk. So the relative risk increment still is about twofold, but we've cut about in, we've almost cut in half the absolute incremental risk for myocardial infarction associated with diabetes. And similarly on the right, although the curves haven't diverged quite as aggressively for cardiovascular death, we have a similar finding. So we're making progress with risk mitigation in type two diabetes. It's not quite as optimistic when we look at heart failure. These are hospitalizations for heart failure. And as you can see, there's greater than a twofold increased risk associated with diabetes beginning in 1998. The curves have converged slightly, but there still is almost a twofold higher risk for heart failure hospitalization in the presence of diabetes. And so these, along with some of the heart failure findings from the recent randomized trials, have um, refocused our attention or broadened our attention from looking at atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease outcomes almost exclusively to now paying much more attention to the heart failure related outcomes of type 2 diabetes. So I'm gonna go through three classes of medications that have undergone uh, formal cardiovascular outcome safety assessment in the past 13 years since the FDA began requiring these trials. And so we'll start with the DPP-4 inhibitors. These are once daily tablet medicines. There are four available in the US, citagliptin, saxagliptin, alogliptin, and lenagliptin. All four of these have now completed cardiovascular outcome safety assessment, and all four of them have proven cardiovascular safety. And importantly, uh, in the context of the elderly patient population with type 2 diabetes, a very low or almost non-existent risk of hypoglycemia. Here's a summary, a meta-analysis. Uh, actually, this isn't a meta-analysis. This is just a summary of the four dedicated cardiovascular outcomes trials for each of these four once daily tablet medications. So saxagliptin at the top, alogliptin, and citagliptin, and the last to report was the Carmelina trial of lenagliptin. These were all patients with type 2 diabetes, and they were all placebo-controlled trials. Each trial achieving statistical non-inferiority as, as uh, defined by the FDA, so the upper confidence limit is less than 1.3 for each of these trials but none of these trials represented statistical superiority or any evidence of incremental cardiovascular benefits. So the conclusion from this set of data is that these drugs are very safe, but not incrementally beneficial from a cardiovascular outcomes perspective. Now, if we look at the heart failure outcomes from these trials, it's a little bit of a different story. Um, these are the heart failure related outcomes, and we were very surprised in the saver timmy 53 trial to find that saxagliptin was associated with a 27% statistically significant increased risk for heart failure hospitalization. The next trial to report was the examined trial with alogliptin and a point estimate similarly unfavorable, although that trial did not achieve statistical difference. Um, the point estimate was also of some concern. So then we de developed a formal prospective statistical analysis plans in the TICOS trial of citagliptin and in the Carmelina trial of lenagliptin. And as you can see, neither citagliptin nor lenagliptin have any concern for heart failure safety. Um, they both are neutral, um, no statistical superiority, but both are safe from a heart failure perspective. So some differential treatment effect within this class of medications. 
Turning our attention now to the SGLT2 inhibitors, these drugs have gotten a lot of attention recently and earned that attention by a number of favorable effects on a spectrum of cardiovascular and kidney related outcomes. There are four available in the U.S. These, again, are once daily tablets, empagliflozin, canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, and ertugliflozin. All of these now have completed formal cardiovascular outcome safety assessment, and we'll go through those data again in meta-analysis. So we've published these meta-analyses of the dedicated cardiovascular safety outcomes trials of these four drugs represented on this plot. And as you can see, in order of presentation from top to bottom, the IMPA-REG outcome trial proved statistical superiority for cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke with empagliflozin, a 14% relative risk reduction. That finding was precisely replicated in the CANVAS trials program, a pair of two trials that were prospectively planned to be pulled for a single analysis in the CANVAS program. This was canagliflozin versus placebo, again, a 14% statistically significant reduction in cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke. In contrast, the declared to me 58 trial with dapagliflozin failed to demonstrate superiority on this three-point cardiovascular outcome, cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke, a point estimate of 0.93 and confidence interval crossing unity. So this proves safety of dapagliflozin, but not incremental efficacy. In the Credence trial, a primary kidney outcomes trial of patients with type 2 diabetes and albuminuric uh, kidney disease, uh, a 20% relative risk reduction for cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke. So reinforcing the finding from the CANVAS trials program that canagliflozin does reduce risk for cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke. And finally, most recently at the bottom, the Veritas CV trial of ertugliflozin versus placebo, a point estimate of 0.99. So no evidence of superiority of ertugliflozin versus placebo, although the upper confidence limit of 1.12 demonstrates non-inferiority or safety of this medication. So across this class of medications, all of the members have been proven safe, and two of the members, empagliflozin and canagliflozin, have product-labeled cardiovascular indications for cardiovascular death for empagliflozin and for the composite of cardiovascular death in my stroke for canagliflozin. If you look just at death alone, the only drug in this class that favorably affects death as a single outcome is empagliflozin in the Empareg outcome trial, a point estimate of 0.62 or 38% statistically significant reduction in cardiovascular death. And again, based on this finding, <coughs> empagliflozin has a product labeled indication for cardiovascular death risk reduction. All of the other uh, three members of the class have point estimates in the favorable direction, but none of them are statistically different from placebo. And so it's fair to say that they're all safe, but not incrementally beneficial from a cardiovascular death perspective. A little different story when we look at heart failure across the class. There is complete consistency across the class on their effects of heart failure hospitalization and also the composite of cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure. And uh, each one of the Four agents in all five of these trial programs have statistical superiority versus placebo at reducing the risk of incident heart failure or hospitalization for heart failure. So clearly a class effect when it comes to heart failure. And then the last outcome with the SGLT2 inhibitors I'll discuss is this. These are the composite kidney outcomes from each of the four trial programs, each of the four compounds. And again, very high level of consistency across the class. All of these drugs favorably affect the progression of diabetic kidney disease, most of the time in the context of albuminuric diabetic kidney disease. But again, a consistency of the findings. And of the four drugs, now two of them have indications to reduce the progression of diabetic kidney disease, that is canagliflozin and dapagliflozin have individual indications for kidney disease risk mitigation. Then finally, the last group of drugs, the GLP-1 receptor agonists. There are eight formulations of six different drugs that have been studied in large-scale randomized clinical outcomes trials. And I'll just focus on the um, three that have uh, cardiovascular indications presently. This is a meta-analysis of all of the trials of these formulations. And as you can see in the top for the car cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke outcome, the meta-analysis suggesting a 12% relative risk reduction associated with this class of medications. All of the drugs have a favorable point estimate except for lixicinotide that was studied in the elixir trial at the very top. So the very first trial of the GLP-1 receptor agonist failed to demonstrate superiority. That was followed by the LEADER trial with liraglutide, the SUSTAIN-6 trial with semaglutide, and down towards the bottom, the REWIND trial with, with dulaglutide. So these three uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists 
liraglutide, semaglutide, and dulaglutide now have product labeled cardiovascular risk reduction indications. And finally, at the bottom, um, the point estimate for cardiovascular death mimics that of the three point composite outcome, a 12% class based risk reduction for cardiovascular death. So we now have two classes of medications, the SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists with selected members of the classes with specific efficacy proven and product labels reflecting that, also endorsed by the guidelines. And then finally, especially for an elderly patient population, the DPP-4 inhibitors, although they did not improve cardiovascular outcomes, importantly, um, they are safe medications with a very low risk of hypoglycemia. So I'll conclude with that. We now, because of regulatory requirements, have an abundance of evidence to guide our decision-making for these newer antihyperglycemic agents. We have several to select from that have been proven safe, but not, incre not incrementally beneficial. But importantly, we have three agents in each of two classes with cardiovascular risk reduction proven. And for the SGLT2 inhibitors, also for canagliflozin and dapagliflozin, kidney risk reduction as, as uh, as well. And in closing, uh, cardiologists, and I will extend that to non-endocrinologists, so primary care providers, family practitioners, general internists, uh, should be prescribing these medications, not just for their glucose control, but also for their cardiovascular risk mitigation. And so, Neil, with that, I'll, I'll finish just with a case and uh, let you uh, moderate. So uh, this is a patient we had recently in the hospital. Uh, she was admitted with an, a chest pain syndrome. She ruled out for a myocardial infarction. Um, but she was demonstrated to have three vessel non-obstructive coronary disease at cardiac catheterization. She's 76 years old. She's had type 2 diabetes for about 10 years. She ha is, uh, has obesity with a BMI of just under 35. She has medically treated hypertension and has for about 10 years. She has dyslipidemia and has been treated with a low dose of statin. She has CKD stage 3A. Her EGFR at, in the hospital was estimated at 49 milliliters per minute. And she also has microalbuminuria, micro, a urine albumin creatinine ratio greater than 30. So she was treated with aspirin 81 milligrams daily, atorvastatin 80 milligrams daily, lisinopril was at 20 milligrams daily, and she was provided weight loss and activity counseling. And it was a, a conundrum for us. At, she had an A1C at presentation of 8.5%. And so uh, we struggled a little bit with what the best antihyperglycemic regimen would be for her. So maybe I'll turn it over to you, Neil, and, and we can moderate this, uh, this case well, discussion. That, that, that sounds great. And Darren, let me thank you for such an excellent overview. And I have a question or two that I'll get to after we discuss the case. But Tracy, do you want to weigh in on some thoughts about how you would approach this case? So um, in consideration, I think that it would be appropriate to think about using an SGLT2 inhibitor or perhaps a GLP-1. Um, however, there's some important considerations um, when using these agents in somebody who's 76 years old. Um, I would assume at 76, she's postmenopausal, and this may increase her risk for genital tract infections in itself. Um, SGLT2 inhibitors increase glucose load in the urinary tract and further increase the chances of developing genital tract infections. Um, it would be important to counsel this patient uh, on proper hygiene to prevent that, to mitigate that risk. Um, and she's also starting on lisinopril and an SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, so we'd have to work monitoring her closely for hypotension. And the alternative of thinking about a GLP-1, you might want to consider, or you definitely to titrate the drug slowly to minimize the risk of nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea to protect her from having uh, an acute kidney injury to, uh, due to volume contraction. Those are great points. And when you said genital tract infections. Midha, do you want to clarify for everyone the difference? Because initially, um, when SGLT2s came out, that was clustered as both urinary tract infections and mycotic infections, but actually that's been separated out since then. W would you be kind enough to go over that with people? Yeah, uh, sure. I mean, uh, by the by, the way it, the medications works, there is a glycosuria. So the bar, the the uh, the distal part of the tubule does not reabsorb the glucose back. So now the body is throwing away large amount of sugar, and and so that increases the risk of genital fungal infection. The the UTI part of it is, you know, sometimes it's hard to tease out in older women, especially because they do tend to have 
high risk of uh, and high frequency of urinary tract infection. But I think I, the 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 way to uh, although the mostly the the fungal infection risk is increased, it is reasonable to again educate the people and say that if you develop the rash or you know that is easy to treat, just simply make sure that you get to you know the the right treatment. Uh, if the UTI increases because of the increased frequency, because there will you know there is a higher diuresis with these medications and increase frequency. Uh, if they do not like the frequency part of that, we may have to think about it differently. Uh, but yes, uh, uh, both of them so, can be managed. Yeah, and, and I think that's an important point that, that often, um, certainly if you're not used to taking care of women's health issues, mycotic infections can seem intimidating, but they actually are very easily managed if one is uh, used to taking care of, of, of women's health conditions, whether it's diflucan or with local treatment. And the issue of uh, urinary frequency, remember we wanna be very careful not to assume urinary tract infection because there've been a couple of articles now that said that the increased incidence of UTIs are not that great with SGLT2s. It's mostly mycotic infections and in the elderly. And, and I know, Meet, how this is something that you teach on in other venues that we want to be careful not to overtreat colonization, uh, back to uh, asymptomatic bacteria that we want to make sure we're treating uh, appropriately. Now, um, you know, uh, would would Meathat, can you weigh in, even in an older age group, here this woman was, I believe she was a bit obese, which means she's probably struggled with eating issues for a long time. And she, her A1C was in the eights, which means she wasn't very close to, perhaps not close to where she wanted to be. She seemed very active and engaged. What, how would you think about that with regard to GLP-1 versus an SGLT-2? Would, uh, uh, would uh, potency of A1C reduction and eating issues and obesity enter into your decision? Yeah, yeah. So I would I would make a couple of points here. One is about the BMI and the obesity in older adults. And seventy six year old to a geriatrician is not really an old patient, mind you. But but uh, but I, I think it's important to remember that. Uh, on uh, uh, you know the weight loss in all older adults is not necessarily good, and the way I, I explain it to the patient is that we are we have less muscle mass as we get older from age thirty on. So the muscle uh, so losing more muscle mass is not good for older adults, and so the way to think about it is that it's not good to lose weight by not eating only. You have to continue physical activity and continue to build your muscle and, and lose weight. That's a healthy weight loss. So simply having a medicine that stops you from eating is not necessarily best once you get over 70 or 75. And, and the other thing about is also that for the A1C, I, I tend to now we live in, in in times where there are so many options in oral, injectable, and insulin uh, uh, medications that it's important to know where the hyperglycemia is happening so we can target that. So even C being a mean glucose tells me that, okay, their mean average glucose is somewhere in 170, 180, but does it go to 70 in the morning and go to 400 in the evening? I cannot tell excursions based on the A1C. So not, not overwhelming the patients, but identifying by finger stick where the hyperglycemia is, where the glucose levels are not uh, a problematic can help us choose the right medications to target those, uh, those areas without making patient at high risk of hypoglycemia. It's a and really then, good point. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. No, and then GLP receptor agonist, I, you know, uh, I was a little bit afraid initially for a couple of years after the uh, class came out, but the older patient seems to tolerate that well, especially now with one so formulary. Many of them uh, have easier time of getting that. And if that helps them with the better control, better cardiovascular protection, and, and they can continue to lose weight without losing the muscle mass, that's a good, good uh, group of uh, agents to use.
even in this that's issue. A, that's a great point. If I remember correctly in the look ahead trial, which looked at exercise and uh, diet, but there was less disability in the group that had, there was a uh, longer persistence of good functional ability in the group that uh, got diet and exercise. And exercise is always important at, at any age. Darren, if I can throw a question to you, and in our case, this woman had risk factors, her age, her obesity, et cetera. She also had non-obstructive coronary disease. We think about um, this class of agents as being used in those who are at high risk, and it used to be recommended for those who had established ASCVD, but I believe the guidelines in the last one to two years changed. And they're now saying that not just in those who have established coronary disease, but those who are at high risk would benefit from either a GLP-1 or an SGLT-2. Can you talk about that in the context of this person? So people who are older, who don't necessarily have um, cath or otherwise established ASCVD, are these still important agents to use and why? Yeah, it's a great, great question. And, and we, we are left extrapolating a lot of data here. So sh- this patient falls in the, into the gray zone. Is she primary prevention or secondary prevention, right? So it's very easy. A person who's had an acute coronary syndrome or a revascularization procedure um, fall into the secondary prevention realm. But a patient with a discovered atherosclerosis at what level is the burden sufficient to classify the person as secondary prevention? Now, this patient had three vessel disease, but it was all non-obstructive. Um, at 76 with diabetes and three vessel non-obstructive disease, we chose to treat her as a secondary prevention patient. We gave her an aspirin at discharge. Um, that's debatable whether she qualifies for aspirin therapy or not. But we also opted to give her an SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, there are a few reasons. Um, at, at, at acute coronary syndrome, we've changed a lot of medicines for this patient. And what I don't want to do is put her on a GLP-1 receptor agonist and put her through the nausea and the GI side effects that typically occur in the first week or two um, and have her stop other medicines because she can't tell where the nausea is coming from. So um, she's certainly eligible for a GLP-1 receptor agonist, but she's also quite eligible for an SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, her her uh, waning kidney function really pushes us more towards the preservation of her reserve for her kidneys to give her um, an SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, but again, GLP-1 receptor agonists are quite safe all the way down to dialysis, um, they've been proven. So um, we, could, we, could, you, we could go either way. The other thing, and probably non-cardiologists don't think about this a lot, we ju- we've just put a a hole in her artery, right? So we did a cardiac catheterization and I don't want to start a GLP-1 receptor agonist and and have her be one of the few patients who actually have vomiting and be vomiting a week after yeah. having a arterotomy. So lots of reasons we will kick that can down the road. I think ultimately if her A1C or her glucose measurements still need additional therapy, the, the GLP-1 receptor agonist will be our first go-to. She came to us on metformin and a sulfonylurea. We stopped the sulfonylurea and because of her waning kidney function, we cut her down to half dose of metformin, left her on the metformin and started um, an SGLT2 inhibitor at discharge. And we'll see her in follow-up and, and continue to consider. Thanks for addressing those issues. Tracy, let me hand the baton to you now for our, our third discussion on uh, diabetes in older adults. Excellent. Thank you. Let me just take control. Um, so I want to thank Dr. Munchie and Dr. McGuire for laying an excellent foundation for the information that I'm going to s- discuss, which involves the framework for glycemic management in older adults. Um, it's with the data that Dr. McGuire presented that the American Diabetes Association Professional Practice Committee formulated the framework for the pharmacologic approach for glycemic management. Given the pleiotropic benefits of SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists, we really need to think beyond simply achieving A1C targets, as Dr. Munchi suggested, when we're formulating a regimen for our patients. This is especially important in older adults because they carry a greater burden of comorbidities such as cardiovascular disease, heart failure, and diabetic kidney disease. And it's also equally important to select agents that minimize the risk uh, for hypoglycemia given that our older adults are at increased risk of hypoglycemia due to a myriad of reasons, which include polypharmacy, progressive renal insufficiency, 
a slowed hormonal counter regulatory response, um, cognitive impairments that lead to difficulty adhering to complex regimens and self care, as well as suboptimal hydration levels. So the pharmacologic treatment algorithm that's presented in the 2021 standards of care recommends that upon diagnosis of type two diabetes mellitus, that metformin should be initiated in conjunction with comprehensive lifestyle change. However, since there's an increased prevalence of renal insufficiency in older adults, we might not be able to maximize metformin therapy and have to dose reduce metformin to a total of 1000 milligrams per day when the patient's glomerular filtration rate is less than 45 mils per minute or avoid it altogether when their EGFR falls below 30 mils per minute per minute. And this is where we need to consider our second line options. Um, when considering the addition of a second agent, the general algorithm consensus is to determine whether or not a patient has comorbidities such as ASCVD, um, heart failure, or diabetes-related uh, kidney disease. Um, it, so that we can choose agents to address these important comorbidities. What I would argue is that equally as important in this older adult population is the need to minimize, again, that risk of hypoglycemia in this population. So, Given the data, again, that Dr. McGuire presented, the recommendation for those patients who have established ASC CVD, or as you uh, recommended, Neil, with the change in the guidelines, um, the they have indicators of high risk for a ASC CVD, is to consider the addition of an SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 agonist with proven cardiovascular benefits. For patients with heart failure and an ejection fraction less than 45%, the recommendation would be to use an SGLT2 inhibitor, um, which is pretty uh, standard across the board, um, that reduces the heart failure hosp hospitalization rates. And for those patients with established CKD, which would include any patient with an EGFR less than 60 mils per minute or a microalbumin to creatinine ratio greater than 30, the recommendation is to first consider the addition of an SGLT2 inhibitor, followed by the addition of a GL GLP-1 agonist if needed. Although these agents have established cardiovascular and renal benefits, they're important factors to consider when using these agents in older adults. The GLP-1 inhibitors are available in a pen formulation and require adequate visual, motor, and cognitive skills for appropriate administration. We have to remember that these agents need to be titrated slowly in order to minimize the risk of nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, which may precipitate electrolyte imbalances, dehydration, and acute kidney injuries, especially in frail older adults with suboptimal hydration status. And since they can cause anorexia and weight loss, they may not be the ideal agents for those individuals who are already frail or underweight or already have a poor appetite at baseline. Important considerations when prescribing SGLT2 inhibitors include the fact that subgroup analyses showed that those individuals greater than 65 years of age had a greater reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events as compared to their younger counterparts. However, older adults are much more likely to experience volume depletion and potentially hypotension with the use of SGLT2 inhibitors. And this may be further potentiated in those patients with comorbidities that necessitate the use of concomitant diuretic therapy, such as those with heart failure. Albeit rare, the use of SGLT2 inhibitors are associated with an increased risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. This risk is further increased in the setting of surgery. Therefore, it's important that patients hold their SGLT2 inhibitors at least two days prior to any scheduled surgery to mitigate that risk. And we have to keep in mind that the CANVAS trial, um, with, that the use of canagliflozin was associated with a 26% increase in all fractures as compared to placebo. And while the mechanism isn't quite clear, it's a factor to consider in those older adults with a history of, um, of falls. With this class of agents, we've all observed an increase in cholesterol of about milligrams per decibel. However, keep in mind, despite this increase in this class, this class of agents has proven um, cardiovascular benefit. Um, the thought of, with regard to this LDL increase is that there might be a, a shift in the type of LDL subparticle and that the LDL particles are the fraction of large, buoyant, less atherogenic LDL particles. And as the class effect, 
Uh, we've also observed an increased risk, as we said, genital mycotic infections with these agents. The risk for these infections um, are especially increased, as we just discussed, in postmenopausal women and in men who are not circumcised. This risk um, can also be increased in patients with incontinence. Um, therefore, it's important to systematically assess for these risk factors and to counsel patients about the importance of maintaining proper hygiene. And as I previously stated, it's very important older adults to minimize the risk of hypoglycemia because as age advances, there's an increased risk for cognitive decline and it's associated with an increased risk of, for hypoglycemia. Conversely, we know that severe hypoglycemia has been linked to an increased risk of dementia. So when we focus on this group and the need to minimize hypoglycemia, the recommendations provided by the ADA um, are to use either an SGLT2 inhibitor, a GLP-1 agonist, a DPP-4 inhibitor, and, or a thiazolidinedione, because they're not likely to cause hypoglycemia, um, especially when they're not used in combination with either a sulfonylurea or concomitant insulin therapy. But we do have to keep in mind, as uh, Dr. McGuire pointed out, that heart failure, there is an increased risk of heart failure with thiazolidinedione's and potentially with the DPP-4 inhibitor, saxagliptin, as uh, evidenced in the saver timmy 53 trial. And finally, we know that diabetes is a chronic and progressive condition, and more and more agents get added over time to attain glycemic targets. Therefore, we shouldn't be surprised that overtreatment is common in older adults. And for some patients, there may come a time when it's appropriate to begin to de-intensify or simplify a complex regimen when the risk of hypoglycemia or the burden of a complex regimen outweighs the anticipated benefit for the individual. And with that, I will start the cases and then turn it back over to you, Neil. So our first case um, is a 72-year-old gentleman who was recently hospitalized for decompensated heart failure. His ejection fraction is 30%. He has stage 3B CKD and an A1C of 7.8. In addition to his sacubitril valsartan, metoprolol succinate, and furosemide, he's maintained on metformin 1,000 milligrams twice daily. The question is, is this an optimal regimen? And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Th thanks so much, Tracy. And that, that was a great talk. And I, the evidence of an excellent talk is when people have questions about it. And some questions came in. So before we discuss the cases, let's take a couple of questions from our audience. And in doing so, let me encourage our audience to please continue to submit more questions. Uh, one question was, please discuss, uh, are there particular fluid needs when we start an SGLT2 that we ought to be warning patients uh, about? Of course, if they start an SGLT2 and their sugars are high, they're going to have some diuresis. Are there things we should... How should we advise them when they start an SGLT2? Tracy? Um, generally, we're, when we're starting an SGLT2 inhibitor, um, we are concerned that there's going to be an increase in diuresis. But this is really only about 350 to 400 mLs per day over the course of the entire day. And it's actually only one additional void. Um, and typically, we're starting these medications because of the compelling indication of either heart failure or renal disease. And these would be situations in which we would, wouldn't want patients to take in excess volume um, unnecessarily. So it's a fine-tuned balance. And typically, across the board, I don't um, force uh, patients to drink more than, than their usual recommended amount based on their cardiac and renal function. I don't know if you'd agree with that, actually. No, I, I, I completely do. That, that's wonderful and a great way to address that question. Uh, Midha, another person asked, um, a number of people in the audience asked questions as to, would you change, how do you adapt the recommendations that Tracy just went over for patients in a nursing home or assisted living environment? Yeah, no, that, that's a, that's a good, good question. And I think the, 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 difference or the way you change that basis on patients, where the patient's barriers are, right? I mean, I think that was the point of what I, I discussed that is the patient unable to, are they at the point where they are needing uh, injectable therapy, but they don't have support system, then you would want to go with uh, the oral medications versus 
If they can uh, do once a day basal insulin, then you can get away with using something, you know, titrate the basal insulin to the fasting, use it in the morning that allows you to use much larger doses. And then you use one of the non-insulin agents to, to take care of the postprandial um, prandial uh, hyperglycemia. But I think uh, the po point about where the patients are is not as much about which medicine is better there, but what are the barriers that we can, we have to, what are the challenges and then what medications would work better. In nursing home population particularly, they, it's harder to use metformin or even SGLD2 inhibitors because of the uh, renal dysfunction, even if they don't have renal uh, dysfunction at baseline, they have tendency to go back and forth, up and down. And so you would be better off with medications that you can use like GLP-1 receptor agonist. You would look at, uh, keep an eye on the weight and make sure that patient is not losing weight consistently. Many a times they stop uh, after uh, losing a little bit in the beginning. But um, my, my answer would be identify where the hyperglycemia is uh, and then identify what are the particular challenges for that patient and then adapt all these different medications to that. Those are really good points. I know for myself, and I spend two sessions a week in a nursing home uh, taking care of patients, and I've been impressed how variable people's appetite is from day to day. You know, one day that person's just eaten everything, put on their tray. The next day, not. And I've had I. I've actually, in that group, I really like the DPP force. I'm thrilled to see the good safety data because uh, many of them, linagliptin being one, uh, can be used in people with advanced renal insufficiency and it has a low incidence of hypoglycemia. So if we're not worried right about the long span for the cardiovascular benefit and for microvascular disease benefit, but we wanna keep that sugar reasonable in order to not have symptomatic hyperglycemia. Sometimes that's a, um, has become one of my uh, go-to agents. There's a excellent question on Fournier's gangrene and, and I'll read it because of the tenor of the question. And what I mean by tenor is sometimes um, there's a cognitive bias toward things that are really scary having greater weight attached to them than they actually need. And so th this person uh, submitted the following question, should a woman with known chronic vaginal yeast infection have the SGLT2 discontinued? I'll come back to that in a minute, but that went on to say, if appropriate for other considerations, how would you address her high risk of Fournier's gangrene? And I'll ask uh, Darren, you were nice enough to put some data into the chat, if you can go over that. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think there probably is a small risk associated with the class of medications for Fournier's gangrene, but we, we really have to understand how small that risk is, and in the context of very robust clinical outcome benefit across the spectrum of outcomes. And so, you know, we're used in cardiology to do risk benefit and assessments of our therapeutics. We use anticoagulants all the time and thrombolytics, and we know we're going to cause some bleeds, but the totality of the evidence is we get way more benefit than we cause harm. So in that context, I was uh, on the executive committee of the Declare to Me 58 trial. As that trial was ongoing, this Fournier's gain green issue arose, and we prospectively captured throughout that trial as an adverse of special interest cases of Fournier's gain green. We captured any, remember, Declare was 17,000 plus patients, median follow up of four years. Over a 70,000 patient year observation, we had a total of six events, one event with dapagliflozin, and five with placebo. And so um, in a systematic surveillance of a huge prospective data set, we, we didn't find an imbalance. So uh, the take home point here is patients with type two diabetes will occasionally get Fournier's gangrene. Whether it's associated with this class of drugs, we still are uncertain, but even if it is, the risk signal is so small, almost unmeasurable that it shouldn't enter into consideration. I think as clinicians and providers, we may need to be cognizant of this, to be aware that it exists if it does exist, but it shouldn't factor into decision-making for prescription. Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting. The 
the rate of anaphylaxis with penicillin, and at least in primary care, we prescribe a lot of antibiotics and give amoxicillin far more often than we should, but the rate of anaphylaxis is one in 20,000, and that's in the same range as if it exists, that the, the rate of uh, Fournier's gangrene with this class, with SGLT2. So it really important to be aware of, but as Darren said, really not put a lot of weight onto. The first part of that person's question, in someone who's having chronic vaginal yeast infections, I, I wouldn't use an SGLT2 here. If they're already having, uh, battling a chronic problem, there's a lot of, other, we live in this wonderful age of lots of choices, and that probably wouldn't then be my first choice. There's another question, um, Tracy, if I can ask you or me to have to take about uh, bladder cancer uh, and the SGLT2s. Is that a concern? I'll let Dr. Munchie respond. Well, yeah, I, I'm not, uh, I, I don't know if we have it as well teased out as TZDs. I, I know that uh, it, it is also, as you say, it's a very clinician sensitive sensitivity issue uh, with the data versus how frequent it is. Uh, I used to love TZDs in older patients uh, because it is, uh, you know, there is a significant insulin resistance and it worked well but you see one or two cases and it's hard to tease it out between how many you see it in patients without diabetes versus somebody on TCD. Uh, but I, I'm not aware of as much of, uh, as worried about the SGLT2 inhibitors as, uh, as it, it was. And uh, perhaps maybe we need more data, but I, I don't know if anybody else, uh, Darren, yeah. Yeah, I'll chime in. That's again in my wheelhouse. Um, we prospectively designed the DECLARE trial to look at first cardiovascular safety and second, specifically bladder cancer. Okay. So we actually had to extend the duration of the trial to capture our 67 required bladder cancer cases. We ended up capturing 71. We prospectively captured them as an endpoint and they were centrally adjudicated. And the numbers uh, fell out to be 26 versus 45, um, a point estimate of 0.57 favoring dapagliflozin. Um, we wouldn't go so far as to claim that DAPA prevents bladder cancer, but with substantial confidence, we can say there is no signal in a 70,000 plus patient observation, patient year observation, that there's any bladder cancer problem with dapagliflozin. Thanks for, Darren, for answering that, because I know early on there were some concerns and they seem to have fallen by the wayside. And, and I think that data set makes us feel very confident about the one. One thing uh, I think, Tracy, you alluded to, but I do want to emphasize for people with the SGLT2s is the, uh, the ability to use them at a lower EGFR than, and this is off-label label advice, so, you know, we say that, um, but but the studies looked at them below an EGFR of 45. So they lose their glucose lowering uh, potency at lower EGFRs, but they maintain their benefit for heart failure and for renal protection down to EGFRs considerably lower down to, we'll use a rough number of 30, Darren, would that be a fair number? Maybe even oh, lower. Yeah, yeah, even to 20. Um, so the uh, emperor reduced trial of empagliflozin low at heart failure enrolled patients with an EGFR as low as 20. So mm -hmm. that's in the that's in the that's in the cardiology guidelines now for heart failure is so DAPA to 30 and IMPA to 20. Correct. Yeah. So as a geriatrician, I can just make one quick point would be that when when we are doing that, a lot of times, especially the frail older patients. Uh, with the when they are being treated for congestive heart failure and with multiple uh, diuretics, their blood pressure tends to run low many a time. So just keep an eye on that when you add the SGLT2 inhibitors. Maybe a, uh, the diuretics needs to be a little cut up, you know, cut down on the dose or or keep. But but blood pressure and and risk of fall, uh, you know, separate from from this issue, just as a balancing with the with the uh, yes, benefit on CHF. Yeah. 
Those are really great points. And so we've made a lot of really great points over the course of the hour. We've gone over putting into perspective treatment in older adults. We've gone, uh, Dr. McGuire, into doing a deep dive on the cardiovascular benefits of the SGLT2s and the GLP1s, the benefit for heart failure and renal protection with the SGLT2s, the safety of the DPP4s. Tracy, thank you for going over the ADA algorithm and again, doing a deep dive on uh, pharmacologic management in the elderly. We covered a lot of ground, answered a lot of questions. I want to remind people that No Diabetes by Heart has several more webinars coming up. Go to, it's hard to remember, I realize, nodiabetesbyheart.org for further information. Uh, everybody, thank you so much. Thank you to our sponsors. Uh, thanks so much for a really productive hour covering a lot of information. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.